Hi there. In this lecture, I'm going to focus on foreign relations of China uh, with the usual disclaimer that I am not going to do a comprehensive overview of sort of power politics and international relations. I'm going to focus on three case studies that I think are particularly important for showing us how political power operates in China and how that regime maintains its legitimacy. Let's start with Taiwan, which I think is, if not the most strategically important, possibly the most psychologically important foreign policy issue for China today. So the backstory is Taiwan is an island off the east eastern coast of China. At various points in its history, it's been under the sovereignty of China, of Japan. Um, and in 1949, it becomes the refuge for nationalists under the leadership of Chiang Kai-shek, who have uh, clearly who are losing the civil war with the communists for control of mainland China. And they flee to Taiwan and essentially set up what they view as a temporary headquarters there. Um, Chiang declares the establishment of, or rather the continuation of a country called the Republic of China, sometimes I'll call it the ROC, with its capital in Taipei, the North the uh, most major city in Taiwan. Um, at the same time, Mao Zedong is going to declare the establishment of a new state called the People's Republic of China with its capital in Beijing. And they are both essentially going to maintain the posture for the next several decades that they are the one and only China. Um, Chang's posture, the nationalist posture is essentially, um, this is a temporary setback. We uh, are still the legitimate governments of all of mainland China, of all of that area shaded in purple as well as orange on your map. Um, but the, in practice, um, the PRC is establishing actual on the ground control over mainland China in this period. For much of the next couple of decades, the sort of capitalist side of the Cold War is going to continue recognizing Taiwan as China's legitimate government. They will not establish diplomatic relations with Beijing. They're not going to have ambassadors in Beijing. Um, and they're going to continue uh, dealing with Taiwan as if it is, in fact, in power in all of China, even recognizing that that's not the situation on the ground. Um, but as, the, as it becomes clear that the ROC is not, in fact, about to launch a takeover of the mainland um, and reestablish itself in action, actual governments in all of China, um, that diplomatic recognition is going to start to shift to the People's Republic of China as it becomes a more established political force. So in 1971, um, after decades of dispute, the United Nations is going to recognize the People's Republic of China as the actual, as the legitimate governments of China, which means, among other things, that Mao Zedong is now going to get to appoint an ambassador to fill one of the permanent five seats on the UN Security Council. The United States is going to establish diplomatic relations and a accord formal recognition to China, to the People's Republic of China in 1979. This kind of uh, comes with an agreement that the U.S. is not going to openly challenge China's belief that it has sovereignty in Taiwan, but the United States is going to continue extensively supporting Taiwan um, through, among other, th other things, uh, extensive sales of sophisticated military equipment. Um, Taiwan and China start uh, engaging increasingly in some degree of dialogue, particularly after the death of Mao during the reform and opening period. Um, and out of these negotiations emerges a really fuzzy set of principles known informally as the 1992 consensus, which basically boils down to both sides saying, we agree that there's one China and we're just not going to talk about which China it is. Um, so from the PRC's side, this entails the um, belief that ultimately Taiwan will be reintegrated into China as a province, that Taiwan uh, is legitimately a province of China, um, just that it's, you know, not uh, it's failing to acknowledge Chinese sovereignty uh, stubbornly at the moment. Whereas for Taiwan, there's some more political disagreement among Taiwanese uh, on this issue. Um, but you'll find a range of opinions from we should eventually be reunified with China with significant autonomy, or uh, we should just maintain this status quo because it seems to be working out pretty well for us. Today, um, here's the basic update on the situation. Taiwan is unquestionably um, an effectively self-governing country. Um, it was under military rule for a long period of time, while Chiang Kai-shek and his party uh, could say, we're still in civil war with China, even though hostilities had actually died down. Um, but it democratized in the 1990s and held its first uh, presidential elections in 1996. So today, Taiwan functions more or less as a sovereign state with a democratic regime, except with this really significant significant difference that because China is so powerful and because China continues to maintain this very deep-seated belief that Taiwan is a province of China, not a sovereign country, Taiwan doesn't get a lot of the privileges of recognition as a sovereign state on the international stage. So for instance, if you watch the Olympics, you might notice that there's always these athletes who compete under the flag of something called Chinese Taipei. That came about because the PRC insisted uh, that in order to participate in the Olympics, it would not allow a different country to compete under the Taipei 
Taiwanese flag. And so you'll see other those kinds of symbolic representations in which occasionally on the international stage, Taiwan is demoted to this sub country status, even though in all for all intents and purposes, it actually governs itself. Um, since the reform and opening period, there's been an increasingly strong and important economic relationship between mainland China and Taiwan. Um, as China started opening up, this was really a boon for Taiwanese manufacturers who realized here is a country close to us with cheap land, cheap labor, and increasingly open economic regulations. Um, we can invest there. We can open up factories. We can save a bunch of money on labor costs. And so Taiwan is actually a major, major source of foreign direct investment for China, especially early in the reform and opening period. China today is Taiwan's uh, number one trade partner. Um, that said, there remains this kind of underlying tension about what exactly the status of Taiwan is. And the Chinese government is extremely sensitive to any rumblings of pro-independence sentiment in Taiwan. So the possibility of conflict remains there. Um, the National People's Congress in, I think, 2005 passed a law authorizing China to take military action um, if Taiwanese independence ever appeared to be imminent. And China occasionally engages in these maneuvers um, you know, off of its coast um, near Taiwan. Taiwan, where it's attempting to kind of protect its prerogatives. It has a lot of military installations that are essentially uh, preparing for the prospect of war with Taiwan. Um, it's worth noting that this is not an imminent prospect because fewer than 10% of Taiwanese people ever so express any support for actual formal independence. If you look at public opinion polling from Taiwan, it kind of seems as if the general consensus is we're okay with de facto independence um, and we don't really feel a need to push to the uh, stage of formal independence, of formal sovereignty, given the amount of risk that that would entail in terms of angering the PRC. Okay, I'm gonna shift now to something that is not a foreign policy issue. It's really important that we know there's just general acknowledgement that Hong Kong is not foreign to China. It's a part of Chinese sovereign territory, but I'll try and make it clear why this has repercussions for China's foreign policy anyway, over the course of talking about Hong Kong. Hong Kong comprises um, two, two big islands, a bunch of other smaller islands, and then a peninsula in southeastern China. Um, and it was removed from Chinese sovereignty and handed over to Britain as a colony in 1842 when the British, I am not making this up, fought a war to force China to buy their drugs. That's the first opium war. There's a second one too. History is fun. So the British governed Hong Kong as a colony for 150 years, ending in 1997 um, when the British lease on the peninsula called the New Territories expires and uh, Hong Kong is handed back to Chinese sovereignty. At that time, China makes a variety of promises to Britain, essentially saying we are going to respect Hong Kong's autonomy for at least 50 years. And so what that means is that when Hong Kong is integrated back into the PRC, its legal status is that of a special administrative region. And the idea is that that's supposed to give it more autonomy. This is important because Hong Kong has this, at this point, 150 year legacy um, that is imposed by British rule with its own domestic administration uh, and a limited degree of self-government um, with its own trade links, particularly with Western countries. Western countries really like investing in Hong Kong before the handover because it has relatively strong rule of law and a thriving capitalist economy. And that remains the case after the handover as well. It's got its own currency. It's got its own financial sector. Um, and this is actually advantageous for China. China being able to annex this ter territory with these thriving financial institutions and a lot of multinational corporations with headquarters there uh, as it's looking to open up its economy and attract foreign investment. So the initial political arrangement in Hong Kong reflects that willingness on the part of the Chinese Communist Party um, to give some degree of autonomy to Hong Kong and particularly to let it be financially profitable for China. Um, and that is embodied in a governing principle known as one country, two systems. The idea here is that China is going to control uh, defense and foreign policy for Hong Kong. Hong Kong doesn't get to have its own army or sign its own uh, major treaties in most respects, but Hong Kong will continue to run its own executive and legislature and judiciary um, with a higher degree of democracy, with a higher degree of rule, rule of law, with continuing influence of some of those colonial traditions, um, and in general with greater protections for individual civil rights and civil liberties. That said, put a big asterisk on that because this is still a unitary system. The Chinese have made this promise that, to Britain that they're going to respect Hong Kong's autonomy for 50 years, um, but that's not really legally enforceable. The British, British are not super likely to invade Hong Kong in case the Chinese try and compromise its independence. Um, and at base, China is still a unitary system that has the power to do what it wants. 
in the last couple of years since I'm recording this, before I'm recording this lecture in the summer of 2021, um, that has become a really, really salient issue in Hong Kong. Basically, since the handover, there have been intermittent pro-democracy protests calling not for outright independence for the most part, but for marginal improvements in the degree of democracy in Hong Kong. So, for instance, sometimes people will protest for the right to directly ex uh, elect their chief executive. Um, sometimes they'll protest when Beijing eliminates certain candidates for chief executive or for the legislative council. Um, so sometimes they'll call for less interference by Beijing. But as with Taiwan, there's not a huge amount of support for outright independence in Hong Kong public opinion. Even in 2019, um, after tensions had really escalated, somebody did a poll and found that only 17% of Hong Kongers supported outright independence from China. That said, there have been occasional protests against the influence of China, uh, calling for more democracy and more self-government in Hong Kong. Um, and things really hit the fan, as the kids say, um, in 2019. At that time, China or the Hong Kong government, under the influence of Beijing, had proposed a law that would allow Hong Kong to extradite suspects in crimes committed abroad to a variety of countries that Hong Kong previously didn't have extradition arrangements with. Um, this initially arose because of a case in which a citizen of Hong Kong allegedly committed a crime in Taiwan and then couldn't be extradited, extradited from Hong Kong to Taiwan to face trial there. Um, but the concerns arose and people started protesting against this proposed bill in 2019, because one of the implications would have been that Hong Kong residents could have been extradited to mainland China to face uh, criminal charges. Um, and that raises obvious concerns, given the huge difference in the degree of protections for criminal defendants and generally speaking, the rule of law and judicial independence between Hong Kong and the rest of China. Um, so there's massive protests in 2019, some of which turn violent, that ultimately in the short run succeed. The chief executive ultimately decides to withdraw that bill from consideration. But Beijing is going to look at the degree of violence, the degree of disorder in those protests and say, this gives us reason to impose a broader national security law for Hong Kong, which they have always theoretically had the right to do since the handover, but which previously they had refrained from doing because it was super unpopular in Hong Kong. Uh, and so the PRC government pushed through the National People's Congress, which ultimately has the legal right to make this decision, uh, a really, really broad national security law governing Hong Kong. A couple of things that this law does. It criminalizes acts of succession, acts of subversion, acts of terrorism, any kind of collusion with foreign forces, kind of broadly defined, um, and makes them punishable by life in prison. Uh, it establishes a law enforcement office in Hong Kong whose personnel are accountable to Beijing and not to the Hong Kong local government. Um, it increases surveillance authorities in Hong Kong and decreases the degree of judicial transparency. It allows for closed door trials in certain uh, national security cases. And it gives Beijing and not the Hong Kong courts the power to interpret the national security law. So all of this raises really serious concerns about Hong Kong independence. I think it is probably no longer accurate to say that the Chinese have um, honored that promise of 50 years of um, considerable uh, autonomy. Um, and this has, uh, you know, tensions have continued. Public protests have obviously been somewhat hampered um, by coronavirus related restrictions. Um, but that's definitely something to watch if you are looking for uh, some indication of whether Xi Jinping's government is going to clamp down on Hong Kong's autonomy um, or allow it to, to continue being a somewhat different, uh, allow it to continue operating under the one country, two systems principle. One last note on Hong Kong. Part of the reason why I've rolled this into your foreign policy lecture even though Hong Kong is not foreign to China, is because the major audience for one country, two systems is arguably not Hong Kong, but Taiwan. Uh, early after the handover, there was some speculation that by allowing Hong Kong a considerable degree of autonomy, Beijing could kind of look to Taiwan and say, hey, if you, degree, if you agree to recognize that you're a province of China, like we've been saying you are all along, you won't necessarily have to surrender all of your rights to self-government. You might be able to keep up for a variety of institutions and traditions, but um, recent clampdowns on protests in Hong Kong uh, kind of make it seem as if that wouldn't be the case. All right, shifting gears, I want to talk briefly um, about one major foreign policy and economic development under Xi Jinping's government, uh, which is known a little bit clunky, clunkily in English as the Belt and Road Initiative. This is a massive, massive program of infrastructure investments in Africa, in Europe, in Asia um, that's announced in 2013, shortly after Xi Jinping comes to office. The idea here is to kind of evoke these historically really significant trade routes, uh, which we talk about if you take my AP World class a lot. 
out. That's not a plug. I'm just mentioning it. Um, so there's one part of this program referred to as the Silk Road Economic Belt, um, which is supposed to kind of um, build on these traditional, these classical um, trade routes uh, that ultimately connect uh, Europe with China uh, through Central Asia. Um, and then there's a, a second part of the plan known as the Maritime Silk Road. I find that confusing, but whatever, um, which is supposed to build on the old Indian Ocean trade routes. So the idea of this is that China is going to finance and support the development of just huge, huge quantities of trade infrastructure, uh, highways, railroads, uh, oil and gas pipelines, um, ports, deep water ports. Um, in 60 plus countries, uh, you can see some planned uh, routes on the map that you're looking at here. Um, and the idea is to open up new markets for Chinese exports, particularly to stimulate development in Western China, which would then have better trade links to the rest of the world uh, through the construction of this infrastructure, and also um, to counter American influence in some of the countries um, where China is investing. As I'm fond of saying, it's a little bit too soon for us to say uh, whether this has been a success or a flop or just for show. Um, but one thing that we have seen in the first few years of the Belt and Road Initiative is that a lot of these projects do not necessarily work out super well for the relatively poor countries uh, that are agreeing to host these massive infrastructure investments. Um, a lot of these projects, particularly in poorer countries, involve um, governments borrowing huge amounts of money from China uh, and then hiring Chinese firms to actually do the construction and to run the port or run the railroad. Um, and there's been a couple of highly publicized incidents in which the countries have defaulted on their debt and suddenly China has a massive ownership interest in one of their important pieces of infrastructure. So that's worth paying attention to, especially if you're interested in trade and economic development. If you're thinking about how China is going to uh, compete for not just political, but economic influence in the world uh, in the coming years. That's it. I'll leave it there. Thank you.